provide Reverend James. Reverend James to please open up this session with a word of prayer. Naka. We say under Vinaka Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The Holy Gospel according to Saint Matthew, chapter 10, from verse 16 to 20. I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I acknowledge the custodians of the various places from where we gather online, all part of the sacred creation. And I pay my respects to the people whose identity is intertwined with the land and sea and give our love and share peace with elders, mothers, fathers and children, past, present and future. I acknowledge that a deep spirituality permeates the communities of the Pacific and is at the heart of the way that we interpret, understand and interact with one another and with the natural world. It shapes our indigenous knowledge into wisdom and guides us to act with gentleness and gratitude for the abundance that surrounds us. Our indigenous spirituality and knowledge, the wisdom of our ancients, who read the stars and traveled across our mighty ocean in their giant canoes millennia before European discovery and conquest, considered themselves part of the ecosystem and not above it. This spirituality is enhanced by Christianity and the many faith traditions of the world which have grown roots in our diverse Pacific communities. These faith traditions are shared with the vast majority of those with whom we share this planet. Our Pacific spirituality calls us to embody a profound respect for creation as an interconnected web of life, living as caring and resilient communities and valuing well-being above profit. It calls us to be custodians of God's household in the Pacific. It calls us to be guardians of the Blue Pacific. To our Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on Deep Sea Mining, our guardians of the Blue Pacific. Today's gospel reading from Jesus's sending out of the 12 is a passage I shared last year to our Pacific High Level Champions at COP26 in Glasgow. And I share this today as a word of encouragement, of empowerment and commissioning as you set sail on your vaca for this important mission to protect our moana, our solwara, our Wasawasa, our Mother Ocean, and ultimately our Blue Pacific Continent. This passage bears testimony to those who put their political capital and future on the line for a world that they may not live to see, and to those who think only of what is politically expedient and beneficial in the short term only. You are and have chosen the former, not the latter. We call the world to a new way, a new normal that honors the practice of our ancestors in living in harmony and not exploiting nature, our sister and brother creation. The future of our blue Pacific, the future of this planet depends on the ethics and value systems that govern our relationships with the environment and each other. If there is bad political governance and a lack of social justice, the consequences can be seen in how the community treats its land, its streams, rivers, forests, the ocean, and each other. Conversely, if the significant contribution to the natural environment provides for the community's well-being and is appreciated, this is reflected in how the community governs itself, shares its resources, and dispenses justice. Mendamasu, let us pray. In the beginning, 
before you called forth creation by your davar, your logos, your vosa, your word, before you established your household, the ecosystem that sustains all life, before you called it good and very good, before we needed sustainable development goals in life above and life below the sea, before the desire for more, before insatiable appetites profaned our sacred relationship with your creation, before we began to pillage land and sea, before everything, your ruach, your breath, your life-giving spirit hovered and nourished the immense and unfathomable waters. In affirmation of the many ways we know and experience you, in celebration of and response to your profound love for your creation to which we belong, in response to your command to safeguard your creation, in honor of ancestor custodians and guardian mothers and fathers before us, for sisters and brothers with us and descendants who will come after us, we gather to draw this blue line around our mother ocean to protect her from future degradation for the profit and benefit of a few while her children are left to fend for themselves. We confess that as people, as communities, we have not been able to join our hands to hold firm because we have sought to hold on to empty promises sold with bangles, beads, and baubles. Help us, O Lord, to hold firm to each other, to hold firm to this blue line, to keep our ancient covenant with you and our family of creation. Bind us together in the power of your truth, your love, and your justice. Help us in your wisdom and compassion, deeper than any ocean trench, to be ready to extend our hand of fellowship to those who make the courageous decision to walk this line with us. We pray in the name of your love and truth, your word made flesh, who gave his life for us, who spoke his peace to the sea, and in giving his life, did so that we may enjoy life abundantly. Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend James, and I'm sharing the moderator role with Maureen Benjueli due to internet connections down in Palau. I'm Joey Tao. I'm honored to share this word with Maureen. Sincere apologies from uh, our earlier moderator, Dalciana Samara Brash, who sends her apologies. She's unable to take us through this session. Anyway, just wanted to welcome everybody. Welcome, Your Excellencies. Uh, and to get started, this uh, launch event, just to set the scene, uh, almost 10 years ago, um, it remains very clear that deep sea mining has been a deeply contentious issue uh, in public policy discourse areas in the region. One hand, uh, we have governments keen to exploit mineral resources to build their economies. And on the other hand, we have concerns about the true cost of the impacts of PSM and what it will have on our communities and our way of life for specific people. Over 600 scientists are calling for a pause on BSM to buy a glo global community time to assess the dangers, the real dangers of BSM. Today, there is a growing list of states and non-state actors uh, declaring or supporting various forms of moratoria on BSM. Some provincial and national governments have banned BSM within their respective jurisdictions and the, but the rush for deep sea mining or to mine our ocean floor on an industrial scale presents challenges for our region that demands our immediate and act, uh, unified uh, response. One set of a rather on the set of a new frontier extractive industry and 
territorial acquisition under the guise of green economic development, on the other, the absence of a unified moral voice to rally an effective response. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Honorable Tianao Tuiono, who is part of the Green Party in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Kia ora, welcome, Honorable Tianao. Uh, kia, ora and, uh, kia ora and kia ora everybody. Uh, my name is Tiano Tuiono. I'm a member of parliament here in, here in New Zealand for, for, the Green, uh, for the Green Party. And I want to start by saying uh, warm Pacific greetings. Uh, even though I am in Aotearoa, New Zealand and it's raining and it's cold outside, uh, I am warm in my heart to uh, connect with uh, other parliamentarians uh, around, the, around, the, around the Pacific who are raising their concerns, our concerns about deep sea, uh, deep sea mining. Um, a little bit about myself, on my father's side, I'm from the island of Achu, um, and I'm from my mother's side, I'm uh, New Zealand Māori, uh, from the Ngāpuhi and I Takoto people up, up in the, up in the Taitokero. And, and I guess I'm part of the growing Pacifica diaspora here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Last count, I think there was about quarter of a million of, uh, quarter of, a million of us who have those strong connections back to the Pacific, uh, but then also are concerned about what's happening right on our own doorstep uh, in terms of uh, the impacts of seabed mining close to home, um, in particular out, in, out on the Taranaki coast. Uh, my part in this is to talk a little bit about um, the connection with um, Indigenous peoples' rights um, and Indigenous peoples' movements. And, and for me, it's about recognising that before there were the establishment of states, particularly Westminster, Westminster states and uh, other types of states around the Pacific, Indigenous peoples, Indigenous communities, our Pacific communities have always been here. Um, and uh, Indigenous peoples around the world have been raising concerns about the impacts on, impacts on climate change, but also the impacts on, on biodiversity. And I'm mindful that uh, most of the places, if not, uh, uh, around the world where biodiversity is most intact is where Pacific peoples live. It's where indigenous peoples uh, live. And when I have gone about uh, my travels uh, before the COVID lockdown, of course, um, I have seen that and I've connected with uh, in, with indigenous peoples, um, whether it's whether with our relatives up in the Arctic, uh, with our, uh, our Sami relatives. Um, and I, I've also had the privilege to go around the parts of Australia, in particular with uh, relatives up in Baralua who were organising against the mining companies up there as well and seeing the impact of extractive industries on their land uh, and on the impacts on the way that they would traditionally gather food um, uh, and those sorts of things that are, um, that are embedded in the Indigenous peoples' uh, cultures. Um, the, 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 the Indigenous peoples' movement um, is, a strong, is a strong movement and it has culminated in uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This is, some, this is a document, this is a, a declaration that the world has signed up to, to which determines the, uh, the, the very baseline on where we uh, should uh, look at Indigenous, Indigenous Peoples' rights. And it looks at issues around self-determination, it looks around issues about right to, uh, right to our own language and our Indigenous knowledge. And I did want to acknowledge the contribution of Reverend James just um, earlier as well in recognizing the, the, the connection and the contribution that many of our faith leaders have, have played in trying to raise the alarm with their congregations and within their faith about the, the real need for us to really look at what it means to be connected as a people with a very long unbroken historical connection both to land and to sea and to look at different ways that we can connect to do that. And I have seen that here in in Aotearoa, New Zealand, working with uh, interfaith leaders who are working with their different faith communities to actually raise the consciousness around the impacts on climate change, the impacts of biodiversity, the impact on our marine environment. Um, and so to have that, have that spiritual connection, um, it, it, it tells me that, uh, that we, we cannot only look at this through the myopic lens of, of what corporations and companies can make. Um, and when I think about historically, about extractive industries, we had Phosphate companies come into the Pacific, then they left. We've had uh, rainforest, uh, with logging companies come into the Pacific, they took what they wanted, then they left. Uh, nickel companies, tin mine companies, they come and they take, they have a, a, a similar message about focusing on doing economic good for our, for our communities. But uh, I think it's really mindful at this particular point in time, 
in this particular context, that we are in the middle of a climate crisis, we are in the middle of a biodiversity crisis, and above all of that, we have the impact of the pandemic, we have the impact of, of the COVID crisis, and we can feel the strains economically across, uh, across the world, but also in particular around, around, the, um, around the Pacific at this, at this time. And so um, we know that most of the damage around, around all of these environmental issues are not being caused by the Pacific, they are being caused by the industrialized countries. So my expectation is, and I think it should be our collective expectations that those that pollute uh, and those countries that are responsible for those companies that pollute must do more to support the Pacific, must do more to help alleviate that economic burden so that we can really focus on what the, what the real issues are here. We need to be able to take away that profit, that profit motive and to actually look at what is the cost here? What is the cultural cost? What is the environmental cost? What is this, the, 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 the social and spiritual cost to what they are advocating for at this particular time? Um, so um, uh, on, 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 on that end, um, today in Parliament, in the New Zealand Parliament at two o'clock, uh, we will be asking these questions of the government around uh, our expectations on what is the best and safest way to, to engage with deep sea mining as well, and acknowledging that here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that we have, uh, have iwi uh, and environmental NGOs, and in particular, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge the work of Ngāti Ruanui and Ngāraudu Kitahi uh, and, the and the environmental NGOs, and uh, groups like the uh, Kiwis Against Seabed Mining who have been fighting against seabed, uh, seabed mining companies in Taranaki as well. And then it's an acknowledgement for me that we need to, uh, to, to really to hold on to that indigenous leadership, to hold on to that cultural leadership and to work in tandem with parliamentarians who are, who are passionate and understand the connection between people uh, and the moana, uh, people and the land. Um, and on that, I, I would just like to wish everybody all the best in Palau, uh, but also all around the Pacific. Thank you. And thank you for sharing the experiences in New Zealand, um, but also highlighting the importance of indigenous rights and our Pacific people's rights in relation to this new frontier. Moving on with our program, uh, I'd be honored to uh, invite uh, Honorable Annalisa Boanga, who is our next speaker, uh, joining us from Tuvalu um, for a region that's at the forefront of climate change. Uh, Honorable Sobuanga would be speaking on um, the potential impacts that such a um, unknown industry will have on our people who are already faced and uh, responding to the climate crisis. Welcome, Honorable Sopoanga. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Greetings from Tuvalu, Excellencies, friends, and colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Loud and clear. Chair, uh, moderator, are you hearing me? Loud and clear. On All right. Call. Okay. Uh, beauty. Beauty, thank you. Um, of course, it is a great honor to speak at the launching uh, of the Pacific Parliamentarian Alliance on Oceans and Deep Sea Mining. Let me start by saying that I am deeply concerned about the recent findings of Working Group 2 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, a sixth assessment report, which noted that small islands, tropical corals, are at a high risk from climate change. The IPCC report highlighted the fact that ocean warming and acidification due to increased carbon dioxide levels will cause severe coral bleaching on an annual basis. They also note the impacts that climate change will have on fish stocks in the Pacific. It is therefore uh, very evident that much more must be done to address the impacts of climate change. Major greenhouse gas emitting countries uh, must take much higher reduction targets to avoid the worst impacts. 
greater effort in the form of financial and technical resources must be provided to Pacific Island communities to help them adapt to the impacts of climate change. For those that uh, suffer loss and damage due to climate change, adequate compensation must be provided by the major emitting countries. And these must be done with a sense of urgency. On the last point on loss and damage, we know very well that the Pacific is suffering from the impacts of climate change already. And yet the international community lags behind in providing and a, a, a sort of a lack of support for affected communities. We must create a new funding arrangement for loss and damage as a matter of urgency. And therefore, of course, we must factor in what implications there are of the current crisis ongoing happening in Europe. And I strongly personally believe this should not be used as an excuse by those uh, with targets to reduce uh, greenhouse gases as an excuse not to act, not to follow up actions on what they promised to us in Paris, under the Paris Agreement, but especially in Glasgow during COP26. These words of commitments are empty with no meaning to human to humanity. If they ex the, use the excuses of the political crisis that is unfolding and continuing to grow happening in Europe as an excuse for them to move away, uh, walk away from their commitments. Their commitments is moral and uh, humane based and must be fulfilled with urgency because those countries like us in the Pacific, Tuvalu, uh, Marshall Islands and all the small islands in the Pacific are already suffering from as a result of their industrialization and pollution into the atmosphere. Apart from climate change, of course, there are many issues that threaten the Pacific Ocean. Plastic pollution is a grave concern. I welcome the announcement by the United Nations Environmental uh, Environment Assembly that the UN will commence negotiations of international treaty to control the production and use of plastics. Hopefully this treaty will address the growing amount of plastic pollution from discarded fishing gear known as ghost gear. Uh, and therefore discarded fishing gear is having a profound impact on the marine life of the Pacific. Much greater effort is required to monitor the use of fishing gear when fishing boats return to port. I'm also concerned deeply about overfishing and regular unreported and unregulated IUU fishing in our region. Regional fisheries agreements must be strengthened and distant water fishing nations must take proper steps based on the precautionary measures and also the principle of polluter pace to regulate the, their fishing uh, fleets in the Pacific. The Pacific Ocean does not have the timelines uh, and, and it is not limitless. It does not have limitless supply of fish and marine resources. These fish stocks will be further affected by the impacts of climate change. Let us not use the Pacific, allow the Pacific uh, waters to be used as a field for others to come and reap the riches uh, from our, our very ocean uh, here in the Pacific, and then they disappear into thin air, leaving the Pacific totally dis dis uh, damaged, destroyed by their, their, greedy, their greedy, the greediness and their selfishness to own what is there, there in the Pacific, which is not theirs. Let the indigenous peoples of the Pacific enjoy these resources for the benefit and future benefit of their children and their and generation. I'm also deeply concerned about the proposal by the Japanese government to release radioactively contaminated water into the Pacific from the damaged Fukushima nuclear power plant. This cannot be allowed. Governments must take of the Pacific must stand up and the leaders must stand up to object to this. And it should not use this 
as a way of getting ODA or additional money that is coming from blood uh, initiatives like this because they are killing the people of the Pacific. And I call on the Japanese government and the International Atomic Energy Agency to work collaboratively to find a workable solution to dispose of the wastewater without dumping it in the ocean of the Pacific. I want to welcome efforts to develop an international agreement on marine biodiversity beyond the limits of the national jurisdiction. While negotiations have stalled for the time being, we cannot let minor differences get in the way of an important agreement. This must be done in urgency. The importance of protecting marine biodiversity beyond the limits of national jurisdiction cannot be overstated. We draw particular attention to the need to, to define effective environmental impact assessment procedures on the high seas. We call, call on all nations involved in these negotiations to resolve their differences and ensure that next session is the final one and that a new agreement is concluded. Another growing in, uh, threat uh, to me and to Tuvalu, I believe, are the proposal for deep seabed mining in the Pacific. Why should we destroy our, our ocean floor for quick dollars that is going to belong to the hands of others, like phosphate, like fisheries, like all those uh, that, that they have come to reap our, our resources from our hands, when we know to our unique ocean environment. I call for a moratorium on all deep sea ma uh, mining proposals to be seriously considered in the Pacific. I want to highlight the fact that our ocean is our life force. It is the basis for our existence. We must do everything in our powers to protect the Pacific from a whole host of threats. Much of what I have said comes from the statement from, of course, the Pacific Elders Voice, of whom I also a member and I support. I am a member of the Pacific Elders, and I, as I said, and I look forward to interacting with all of you in the future. While we are elders, we have our future generations clearly in our minds. We are also young and youthful in hearts. Finally, I sincerely hope that this conference will deliver concrete outcomes that will steer us on a path toward a sustainable Pacific Ocean. Faftailasi, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Faftailasi, Honorable Sopwang, and thank you so much for joining um, this launch moment, we also acknowledge uh, Honorable Sobuanga is part of the Pacific Elders Voice. Thank you very much, Honorable Sobuanga. If you've just joined us, um, this is the welcome brother to the Hi. official launch of the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on Deep Sea Mining. Uh, we are set to launch uh, the collective very soon, but moving with our program, I'd like to take us into a short um, event um, organized by the Young Solar Pacific, uh, our representative Elizabeth Crystal Jufa, who is also the Sutai Ocean Fellow. Um, Crystal, rather, Elizabeth Crystal Jufa will be sharing with us the voice of Moana. Thank you, Crystal. Crystal, can you hear us? Hi, Joey. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, Falaba. Um, I will present to you my epistolary poetry on deep sea mining. Uh, it's called Letters of a Dying Survival.
Dear Nautilus 2011, I write to you in shame of what you once were. I greet your death in the era of 2019. Your birth was short-lived. The resounding noise you left behind on the shores of Guinea grow a tired ear to victory for you have passed. Yet your remains lay resounding in the hearts of the new enemy, foe of mine and family of thine. You teethed a shallow greed into the hands of the greatest basin of 30, sharpening your tools to my end, so it seemed, on the waters of Bismarck East Coast. And yet I stand, yet still, yet vast, still afloating. I deliver to you a deaf cry. You've dealt yourself out of time. And though you lay still on the abyssal of broken dreams, on the backs of slaved becoming, I loathe the many who tail still in my moana. Caring tide with eyes like yours and teeth like yours, pockets like yours and whispers like yours, silver tongue. Sediment clouds color the beds of what would have been life anew. Destroying all the reeks before our future, they're soon blind to see. Crippling feet of theirs and taking life that could have been. Faring my seas you dug in search for what you promised as a new path to the improved living. Yet at what cost must you strip me numb? My metal parts wither and dangle at your grinning feet. Hold still, you say, taking hostage of what little is left of I. Copper, cobalt, and so forth. If not careful, there will be no more. Here with hope, I hold in the blankets of thermal hailing. You along with many who, with face like yours, teeth like yours, pockets like yours, shalt not, will not, Fair my flaws again. For what shall become of I? A body without bone, life without form, a drowning force to a helpless living. Be warned, without I, none shall prevail. Sincerely yours, Moana Pacifica, one so are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Christo, Thank you, Joey. Thank you very much for sharing the voice of Mona Pacific on one Solwara. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, we will make sure that that uh, epistle is available online. Thank you very much. Uh, we would move on to our next speaker. Uh, joining us all the way from Maui Nui, uh, Honorable Moetai Brotherson. He'll be speaking on the experiences of the nuclear testing legacy the power play of development states in our region and Maui Nui. Yarona and welcome Honorable Moetai. Yarona Tatu Paatua. Thank you um, all the panelists and uh, all the people watching us on this uh, very important issue of uh, deep sea mining. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to state that I have a very specific uh, position on this issue for uh, French Polynesia is not part of the independent countries of the Pacific. We are still a French colony. And as such, uh, we, we don't have all the, the means uh, to control what's going on uh, with deep sea mining and with the mineral resources. Um, so currently, we are a French uh, collectivity with a special statute of so-called autonomy, uh, which states that uh, we are in control of uh, deep sea minerals, with the notable exception of all strategic materials. But the list of strategic materials is being defined by Paris and Paris only. So this means that whatever they want to put on that list is out of our control. Um, we have a, a long history of, um, I would say, being colonized on the economic level. Uh, we had the experience before the nuclear testing of phosphates in uh, Makatea, uh, which is uh, the same history as Nauru had. 
uh, where the French came and exploited the phosphates for almost 60 years and left the island totally devastated. Um, they made billions and billions and fortunes were made in France with uh, this phosphate. And of course, the argument is always the same, the argument of local economic development. And then when the phosphates ran out, uh, started the nuclear tests. And for 30 years, we had the lie, the state lie of uh, uh, clean nuclear tests. And uh, I would like to thank all the brothers uh, and sisters from the Pacific who helped our leaders and especially the Honorable Oscar Manute Temaru at the time who was uh, fighting against the nuclear tests. The legacy that we have today of these nuclear tests is, well, the balance is very pe peculiar. On one hand, you have France that uh, with those testings um, had, has gained uh, a, a seat at the United Nations in the P5 club as a nuclear power. And France is also today making billions and billions out of uh, civil nuclear um, electricity. Um, and the, the results of the testing that were done in Mao Hinui also contribute, contributed to that. So that's what benefited France. On our side, we are now facing many people already dead from the nuclear induced uh, diseases. And we are still facing many, many every year getting sick and many dying. So that's from the sanitary uh, perspective. From the environment perspective, the legacy may be maybe uh, even more daunting because uh, after the aerial testings, which contaminated the whole uh, area of French Polynesia and even beyond throughout the Pacific, uh, we had the era of uh, underground testings. And those underground testings have, uh, have caused havoc in the and underlining and of the atoll of Moruro. And today we have tons and tons of active nuclear waste that is so-called confined in uh, you know, uh, wells. And some of, of this nuclear waste is also lying in the very lagoon of Moruro. And because of the underground nuclear tests, this atoll is due to capsize one day or the other or the other. So we are all facing not only French Polynesia, but all of us sharing the same Pacific Ocean, this very daunting perspective of those tons of nuclear waste getting dumped into the ocean, our ocean, our mother ocean, when the island of Morua, part of it will capsize. So that's the terrible legacy uh, of nuclear tests in Maohinui. And again, the argument is, well, um, due to the nuclear test, there has been economic development for sure, but to whom, whom benefited uh, this economic development in the end and who's facing the dire consequences of these testings? That's, that's the main question. And the same, the same schema is gonna be, if we don't do anything, is gonna repeat itself uh, at the level of deep sea mining. There are many studies that show that uh, most of uh, those minerals in the French uh, maritime area, which we represent almost half of it. Uh, so most of those minerals are in French Polynesia or in Wallis and Futuna. So tomorrow, it's very, very, very likely that uh, France is gonna come 
to our shores to exploit those minerals, uh, despite the known limitations of the technologies that we have today that are unable to do so uh, without destroying the environment. So this is part of our struggle as uh, Maui independentists. This is one of the reasons why we want to regain our sovereignty, our full sovereignty, to be able to decide not to do such folly. Um, it, is, uh, it has been our leader's quest for many years to prevent, uh, the, prevent spoiling, prevent uh, having all this pollution in our ocean from the nuclear tests at the time and now facing the exploitation of deep sea minerals. So we are, of course, sharing the view of this panel, the view of all the parliamentarians that are associated today and we fully endorse uh, the, the initiative that is going on. And uh, even further, we are, um, we are um, searching for help from your part to help us counter the greed of those big players, France being one of them, uh, to come and exploit the minerals in our ocean. Again, pretending to do so for our benefit, where we all know that in the end, they are doing so for the sole benefit. Thank you for your attention. Maruru uh, Honorable Boyakai, thank you so much for reminding us as we, as the you know industry and you know, global powers pursue this rush to mine our ocean floor, we are once again reminded of the nuclear testing here in the Pacific, uh, also acknowledging uh, the testings that happened in Anawetak in the Marshall Islands, and our Fiji ex servicemen who were also who continue today to. Um, live with the impacts. Uh, thank you very much for sharing uh, the experiences of Mauhi Nui um, as it continues to um, fight for its uh, self-determination under the rule of France. Uh, we stand in solidarity with you and we thank you so much for joining us. Um, moving on with our program, I would now leave this um, session open for commentaries from members of the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on Deep Sea Mining, uh, open for commentaries uh, and contributions. Maybe we could start with uh, the Honorable Kerry Jufa, Governor Jufa from Papua New Guinea. Good morning, Joey. Hi, uh, just confirming that uh, you can hear me. Loud and clear. Thank you. Good morning, Joey, and good morning to everyone that is participating, observing, presenting here as well from Papua New Guinea. Uh, Papua New Guinea has a terrible experience with the uh, seabed mining, being the first nation that actually enthusiastically embraced this project. Uh, well, not all of Papua New Guinea embraced this project, just very certain specific key members of parliament at that time. I was in the opposition and I was very much opposed to this along with uh, a large grouping of NGOs, community members, leaders, churches. Uh, we all opposed seabed mining. And here is a terrible tragedy whereby a nation invested no less than $120 million into this scam. I call it a scam and I'm not going to mince words. It has been a scam and in my opinion, continues to be a scam because what is the point of seabed mining? If you think about it, what are they extracting these minerals for? You know, are these minerals going to be used in some life-saving uh, or planet-saving activity? No, uh, primarily the, one of the major minerals that they're extracting or they're hoping to extract is gold, for instance. You know, which does what? What's its practical value? Nothing almost. 
and most of the other minerals that they're hoping to extract, targeting, are also for very frivolous you know, purposes, luxurious purposes for generating significant profits, which end up at the very top of the predatory elite rich that somehow seem to be running the nations of this world. And uh, I agree with the speakers who have spoken earlier and who commented on the history. In Papua New Guinea, not, we have much experience in this, but in, in throughout, throughout the developing nations landscape, where we are always being fooled. I mean, in the past, it was beads and salt and stone axes. Now, what is it? You know, they've come up with even more elaborate claims. Uh, even scientists have put together data to justify what they're trying to do. But in this instance, the greater majority of scientists all agree that the unknowns are too great. We do not know enough about the ramifications of this particular activity. What are we doing? I mean, the world is, as scientists have been warning us for a long time, racing towards the precipice. With the melting of the polar ice caps, with sea levels rising, global temperatures rising, and all the negative consequences that come along with that. Now we decide that we also want to delve into the deep oceans and start scraping the surface of those oceans so that we could harvest these minerals that are going to just be basically making significant profits for the already rich and uh, have really no practical purpose in life, if you think about it. It's a no-brainer. Every government should say, this is ridiculous. Let's just ban this. There is no, we have not yet developed the means, the technology to transport ourselves to another planet in the event that this planet suddenly is implodes or is destroyed or you know, the negative consequences that we, which I don't think will happen because eventually the world will just get sick and tired of humans and evict them, you know, but with the way we're going anyway. But we, the people of the Pacific, the governments of the Pacific who are here now, we've got to be responsible and say, if the overwhelming information provided by scientists state that this is an activity that is, that is, you know, it's the consequences of which are too, uh, you know, they, they are known. We, we really don't know what it's going to do. What we do know uh, from the activities that have happened in Papua New Guinea, for instance, from initial observations, there were already serious problems. When Nautilus started to go and lurk out in the oceans near the coastlines of the New Island province, dead fish started to appear suddenly on the beaches. The waters were polluted significantly, muddied, and people couldn't go fishing there. This is recorded fact, recorded by communities, of course, uh, villages, churches in those vicinities. You know. So I'm, I'm still very much opposed to this. In fact, the greater majority of parliamentarians are opposed to this. And you know, having been burnt, $120 million, a lot of money for Pacific Island nation, that money could have been better spent on essential infrastructure that we needed. And that was a crime. It was a collection of transnational criminals that came in here, perpetrated this scam, and walked away with a lot of money. And unfortunately, we helped facilitate it. Well, we meaning elements of our government at that time. So, I mean, this is specifically my position, though. I do know that the government that I am part of, I'm no longer in opposition. I was there for almost nine years, um, basically ranting and raving against issues like this and illegal logging and all the other uh, activities that we were allowing in our nation that were detrimental to our own interests uh, with the false pretext that it would be great for us and we needed development and we need revenues and so forth and so forth. I do take note of the small island nations that are uh, saying, well, they need to do this because they are in such dire economic situations that they do need to do this. Okay, well, maybe all of us need to look at that situation. How can we assist them? Uh, what can be done? What, how much do they really need? You know, it's time we also talk to the nations, the developed nations, the nations that are exceptionally 
cash rich, natural resource poor, cash rich. We, on the other hand, are natural resource rich, cash poor. Somehow we can find middle ground. I am sure, I'm sure we can do this, you know. So in regards to my thoughts, those are it. Uh, I'm still very much opposed to this. Uh, I, with my fellow coalition members, feel that the unknowns are too great. And, uh, you know, if scientists are saying so and providing the data and the justification and the reasoning, well, look at the consequences of not listening to scientists. What happens? The consequences are quite severe and the price is often paid by the most vulnerable. In this instance, the Pacific, well, we're the most vulnerable. That's all of us out here on this ocean, in this part of the world, on the only planet that has life on it as far as we know so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Governor uh, Jufa. Uh, thank you for sharing the experiences of, uh, of Papua New Guinea, the experiences of Nautilus in this space. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, this takes us to our final uh, agenda on, on today's launching program. I'm honored to call uh, or rather invite the chair, the, the chair of the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance and DSM uh, to launch our ocean call. Uh, Honorable Reg Ralph Reagan Vanu is the opposition leader of the Parliament. <coughs> Welcome, Honorable Greg Vano. Excellencies, honorable members of parliament, senators, legislators, governors, congressmen and congresswomen, leaders, fellow speakers, partners, and friends. As uh, Joey mentioned, I, my name is Ralph Reagan Vanu, and I am a member of parliament in Vanuatu representing the constituency of Port Vila, and I'm currently the leader of the opposition in Vanuatu's parliament. I'm also the inaugural chair of this new organization, the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on Deep Sea Mining, which is being launched today. And I will now be presenting the Alliance's call to protect our Pacific Ocean before announcing the launch of our Alliance. A healthy ocean is essential for the proper functioning of our planet, indeed for vibrant life on earth. But today, we face yet another human endeavor that threatens to undermine the health of our ocean, the reckless haste to pursue deep sea mining beginning in our Pacific Ocean. Not too long ago, the global community applauded the dedication of a sustainable development goal, STG 14, to the conservation and sustainable use of oceans, seas, and marine resources. The 10-year period from 2021 to 2030 has been declared the decade for ocean science for sustainable development, and deservedly so. The ocean covers 70% of the Earth's surface and constitutes more than 95% of the Earth's surface that is capable of sustaining life. The Pacific Ocean itself comprises nearly half of the Earth's water surface and around one third of its total surface area, making it larger than all of Earth's land area combined. Together, the oceans provide the Earth its largest and most important capacity for capturing and storing carbon emissions, including that from a global economy excessively dependent on fossil fuel. The ocean regulates climate on a global scale. Its biodiversity and the extent of its role as a sustainer of ecosystems are mysteries that modern science is only beginning to discover and understand. The lack of human appreciation of oceans remains unfathomable. As Pacific peoples, the ocean is central to life and well being. From it, we draw our identity, affirm our existence and spirituality, and cultivate and sustain our relationships. In it, we find our place in ecology. Caring for the ocean is a responsibility that also sustains and perpetuates us. This appreciation of the ocean is embedded in the values and cultural traditions handed down to us through generations of custodians. 
but the health of our ocean is already facing unprecedented threats from a multitude of human-induced stresses, such as overfishing, pollution, plastics, nuclear waste and radioactive material, and biodiversity loss. Indeed, the climate crisis, with the related impacts on ocean warming, acidification, and rising sea levels, is also taking a heavy toll. We, the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on Deep Sea Mining, support the overwhelming and growing scientific evidence of the negative impacts of deep sea mining and express serious concerns at the potentially devastating and irreversible damage to ecosystems and habitats. Dangers associated with the risk of giant pet sediment plumes traveling beyond mining sites, smothering and potentially destroying all life forms on the seafloor. The danger of wastewater plumes, including potential toxins lethal to marine life, especially fisheries, an, ec an economic lifeline for the Pacific. Dangers that come in the form of irreversible harms to ocean systems and ecosystem services, ocean biodiversity, and the potential impact of cumulative and transboundary harm. Dangers from the release of sequestered methane and carbon on the ocean floor, and from the resulting compromise of the ocean's climate regulation functions. Within the first three months of this year, subcommittees of the International Panel on Climate Change released what many considered to be the most condemning report so far on current efforts to address the climate crisis. The scientific consensus holds that it is no longer sufficient to merely meet current emission reduction targets. It is also now critical to remove carbon already in the atmosphere. As our islands and people experience and respond to the growing impacts of climate change, scientists warn that the destruction of deep sea ecosystems as a result of deep sea mining will exacerbate the climate crisis. A fully functional, healthy, and vibrant ocean is needed now more than ever. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, however, the justification for and pursuit of deep sea mining continues to gather momentum. The reckless haste to proceed with deep sea mining, which in all accounts is an untested, experimental, and highly speculative extractive industry, is now at a critical stage. Legally binding international regulatory arrangements have now been triggered to facilitate the commencement of mineral exploration as soon as practicable. Without immediate and concerted regional and global action to halt this momentum, deep sea mining activities could be accommodated in our Pacific Ocean as early as July next year. Recent Pacific history is replete with experiences of exploitation under the guise of social and economic development pathways that, in reality, involved frontier industries that were inherently experimental. Decades of atmospheric and underground or submarine nuclear testing, terrestrial mining, and other land-based extractive industries are pertinent examples. Such historical exploitation holds much responsibility for the realities of many Pacific Island societies today. Realities that serve to shrink our options and entice our countries to repeat unsustainable patterns of economic development. Once again, Pacific states are being used as a testing ground in this new frontier industry, not just on associated technological and financial viability, but also in regard to international and national regulatory frameworks for deep sea mining and of its potential ecological, social, and economic impacts. For ourselves, and for our island neighbors that have entered into collaborative arrangements with industry on deep sea mining, we affirm our shared history as a reminder of our past and a caution not to repeat it. We acknowledge the stance taken by Pacific civil society, faith-based organizations, indigenous peoples, social movements, and non-state actors in support of various forms of moratoria on deep sea mining, including respective provincial and national governments that have banned all deep sea mining activities within their jurisdictions. We acknowledge government and community leaders who have either declared a deep sea mining moratorium in one form or another, or, or have warned against the reckless rush with which it is now being pursued. As Pacific leaders and custodians of this vast ocean, 
We are obliged to preserve the ocean for the sake of future generations and for all living and non-living things. The protection of a sacred ocean is our moral, our moral responsibility. Therefore, we the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance, A, call for recognition that the ocean is our common heritage and as leaders, we have a common responsibility and moral obligation for its protection. B, call on all Pacific and world leaders to join the growing ranks of governments, scientific authorities, civil society organizations, global leaders, and indigenous peoples the world over opposing the rush to mine the ocean floor. C, support the call by some Pacific governments for an urgent need to suspend deep sea mining activities in jurisdictions within the Pacific region to allow for greater scientific understanding about the potential impacts of deep sea mining. D, support the growing international call for a moratorium on deep sea mining in line with the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development to scientifically assess whether deep sea mining can be done in a way that avoids harm to ocean ecosystems, recognizing, of course, the interco interconnectedness of these ecosystems beyond national jurisdictions. And E, urge all states, in accordance with the precautionary principle and in support of evidence-based policymaking, to adopt an approach that reviews the scientific evidence to determine whether or not deep sea mining activities should proceed based on an agreed governance structure and regulations that support the inclusion of such measures. We acknowledge the decisions taken by our fellow Pacific states of Nauru, Tonga, Kiribati and the Cook Islands to pursue deep sea mining in their respective jurisdictions and the international area. As the chair of the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on Deep Sea Mining, I appeal to our Pacific leaders and legislatures, and in particular Nauru, Tonga, Cook Islands and Kiribati, to join us and to engage in open talks to addressing the deep sea mining in the Pacific on a regional and not a national basis. And with, rem and with those remarks, I officially declare the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on Deep Sea Mining launched. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Ralph Reagan Mano. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, those joining us today, please join me virtually in congratulating uh, the current chair and his collective of uh, members of parliament uh, for the official launch or the declaration of this launch. Moving on, we have finally come to uh, the end of, or to the final um, round of this official launch program. Uh, just to note in the chat box, you would see a link that takes you to an online portal that has the Our Ocean Statement uh, and has the list of members of parliament and senators, governors who have endorse the statement. Uh, it's currently available in the chat box. Uh, that brings me now to introduce uh, Senator Sabina from Guam, who will end us with a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you so much, Joey and Ali. Half a day Pacific greetings to everyone here. It is truly an honor to offer a vote of thanks to everyone who participated here on this launch of the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on Deep Sea Mining. We thank with deep gratitude for listening and answering to this initial call out to safeguard our ocean from the premature pursuit of deep sea mining. We thank Ambassador Tabola and Mahendra Kumar from the Pacific Elders Voice. We thank Pacific Blue Line Collective, Pacific Network on Globalization or PANG, the Pacific Conference on Churches, the Pacific Islands Association of NGOs, or Piango, the Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, or DAWN, the Tuvalu Climate Action Network, the Melanesian Indigenous Defense Alliance, the Alliance of Sawara Warriors, Pacific Movements and Partners. On behalf of the presenters here today, we also thank the Reverend James Bagwan, the Honorable Tianu Tuyona, 
the Honorable Enele Sapoga, um, the Honorable Gary Jufa, uh, Crystal Jufa and her moving poem, the Honorable Muatai Brotherson, our chair, the Honorable Ralph Reganvanu, His Excellency Sir Iataleli, former Governor General of Tuvalu, and the Pacific Elders Voice. Uh, we, uh, we thank the Honorable Lenora Kerekere Tabua, uh, the Honorable Theanila Roca Matbob, Maureen Penjueli, the Honorable Tarita Holm, and we thank Joey Tao and all, the, all of those at the Secretariat and who made this assembly possible. As Pacific peoples with experiences informed and descended through millennia of Pacific history, the lessons of exploitation, but our cultures are rooted in lessons of stewardship, sustainability, and perseverance. Let those values guide this journey and galvanize more of us to action. Urgent political leadership is needed, and it is right that this leadership should come from the Pacific and fitting that it should emerge from our ocean conference. Once again, we extend our sincere gratitude for all who have come and made this assembly and lodge a protectors possible. So this Masi. Thank you very much, Senator Sabina, for those, uh, for the vote of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, leaders, friends, partners, this brings us to the official end of this event. I'd like to thank you for joining us virtually, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, and I invite you to support this alliance, rather the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on DSM as we move forward uh, to call for a pause, a suspense, a stop on the rush to minor ocean, on the rush to minor ocean flow. Join us in drawing the Pacific Blue Line in response to DSM. Thank you, Tomas, Vinako Vakalevu, Mei Takimata, and good morning.